This video is brought to you by Raycon earbuds with a great sound at a great price. You can check them out at buyraycon.com forward slash geographics. More on them in a bit. I may be making up a claim here, but today's destination may possibly be the most photographed, the most visited, and the most famous of all European royal residences. And before you sue us, dear Louvre, I mean those still in active use. Its exterior profile may appear suitably regal and harmonious, it may offer the idea of stable, secure power, and yet its facade belies a complex and controversial history replete with external infiltrators and internal scandal. Welcome to Buckingham Palace, London. As we explore its history, we will get to meet those who built it and those who broke into it, a varied gallery of monarchs and architects, but also stalkers, spies, and other unwanted guests. Before it became a palace, this building had a humbler designation, Buckingham House. But even before it had been built, the lands beneath it had an interesting story of its own. During his reign at the beginning of the 17th century, King James I made plans to produce silk in great quantities. To do that, he needed to rear silkworms, and to feed them, he needed mulberries. So on the land that eventually became the gardens of Buckingham Palace, the king planted his mulberries. Well, not personally, of course. He probably hired someone to do it because, you know, he was the king. In 1622, James's son, Prince Charles, traveled to Madrid with diplomat Lord Astor in a bid to fix him up with Princess Maria Anna. The plan did not succeed, but in 1628, when he became king, Charles rewarded his old chum Astor with the Mulberry Gardens and a large house that had been built on the site. The house and the land swapped hands several times until a new tenant took occupancy in 1698. He was John Sheffield, the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke was not happy with the building, as it felt too old-fashioned to his taste. Changing the curtains and redoing the plumbing was simply not enough, so John raised the house to the ground and rebuilt one from scratch. Well, not personally. I expect he hired someone to do it because, you know, he was the Duke. Sheffield had assistance from none other than royal architect and controller of the works William Tolman, known for rebuilding Hampton Court Palace and for introducing Baroque architecture to England. So, you know, he wasn't just any cowboy builder. The newly christened Buckingham House became a piece of royal property again in 1761 when King George III bought it for his wife, Queen Charlotte, to use as a family home close to St. James's Palace, where many official functions were held. And a family home it became indeed, as this is where Charlotte gave birth to 14 of their 15 children. In 1820, the new king, George IV, decided to renovate the house to use for similar purposes, but six years later he had a change of heart. At this time, many members of the government and of the aristocracy believed that London missed a proper royal residence, an acceptably lavish palace that could rival the not-so-humble abodes of other monarchs on the continent. The king set his sights on Buckingham House as a promising starting point for such a palace and gave free reign to architect John Nash. Nash was the most famous architect of his time, responsible for the planning of Regent's Park, Regent's Street, and the Theatre Royal. He was also a close friend and protege of the King's, although satirists at that time attributed this patronage not to Nash's actual skills, but to the notion that his wife was the King's lover. Whatever the reason, the architect had received the commission, and he had to start building. But to do so, Nash needed cash, so George IV approached the Parliament for finances, something he was very much used to since his first days as the Prince of Wales and then Prince Regents. The King had relied on the House of Commons and Lords to replenish his pockets and pay his debts. It should be noted here that the British Army had just conducted a costly campaign in terms of both ounces of blood and coin against the Burmese Empire. And yet members of Parliament eventually agreed to fund the palace, understanding that it would become a landmark of national interest for London. They did, however, impose a tight leash on John Nash to ensure that he stayed within budget. And spoiler alert here, he definitely didn't. The initial budget had been set at £150,000, which is about £15 million in today's money. But Nash apparently had little time for fancy distractions like drawing plans or ensuring that the building work followed some soundly designed models. On top of that, George IV was a reliably consistent meddler. Predictably, these inefficiencies resulted in several parts of the palace being rebuilt 
time and again. Nash kept begging the parliament for additional funds, which he obtained thanks to the king's patronage and the backing of the cabinet. In the meantime, Londoners looked at the work in progress with barely disguised contempt. The palace was described by the London Standard as most tasteless and most inconveniently contrived and lacking one particle of majesty or magnificence. In June 1830, the king died and was succeeded by his younger brother, William IV. With his protector gone, John Nash was asked by Parliament to provide full disclosure on the project's expenses. He tried to avoid the confrontation by claiming that pains and giddiness in the head had made it impossible for him to properly keep his books. But in September, Parliament and the Treasury realized that Nash had spent £502,000, more than three times the original budget. Unsurprisingly, John Nash was sacked, and King William appointed Edward Bloor as the new architect to finish the job. Nash may have splashed the cash, but eventually his job was not as tasteless and unmajestic as the standard had portrayed. He had doubled the size of the main block of the original Buckingham House and redesigned the front by using mellow bath stone, a staple of the elegant Georgian architecture. He had also managed to incorporate influences from the French neoclassical style, a favorite of King George's. Nash had demolished the north and south wings of the original house and then rebuilt them on a larger scale. The building now had a U-shaped plan with the wings enclosing a large courtyard. At its center, Nash placed a triumphal arch to commemorate the British victories at Trafalgar and Waterloo. The prodigal architect also remodeled the interior, carving out impressive state rooms that were truly worthy of a powerful court. These rooms have remained virtually unchanged since then and form the bulk of the areas that are open to tourists today. Buckingham Palace was continued in 1834 with architect Edward Bloor. Well, he added an attic, aka a top floor. And just before we get into the rest of today's video, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon make great earbuds with great sound at an affordable price point. They're all about innovative earbud design at prices that won't break the bank. So they sent me this pair of everyday E25 earbuds, and I've been using them for a couple of days, and they really fit easily into the ear. They also deliver six hours of playtime, and what I particularly like is the Bluetooth pairing just works. I don't know, Bluetooth sometimes is a struggle, things don't pair, you don't know why. Every time I connect with these, it's just like, boom, connection established. No problem. It's pretty great. Plus, they come in this case, which, as well as having a very satisfying close, there you go. It also recharges these earbuds four times, so that's pretty fantastic. Now look, I've used cheap earbuds, I've used expensive earbuds. What Raycon do is they deliver a premium experience at about half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. So go to buyraycon.com forward slash geographics and you'll get 15% off your order. And let's get back to today's video. William IV never actually moved into his new palace, using it only for protocol and ceremonial purposes. The first sovereign to permanently take up residence at the palace was Queen Victoria, who moved there in July 1837. Almost as soon as she had moved in, the Queen had to contend with the first unwanted guest in our list. His name was Edward Jones, also known as Boy Jones. At the age of 14, the boy developed an unhealthy obsession for the young Queen, so in 1838 he snuck into the palace, which was largely unguarded at the time. He was caught three times and kicked out three times, but he always returns. Jones confessed to breaking into Buckingham Palace a total of four times, but this was likely an understatement. On one occasion, he stole food from the royal kitchens and was caught sitting on a throne. But he is best remembered for another misdemeanor, stealing the Queen's underwear. Every time he entered the royal apartments, he grabbed a handful of, with all due respect, Her Majesty's regal underpants and stuffed them down his trousers. Unsurprisingly, the royal household and the government were not not overly concerned by this glaring gap in security, they were merely annoyed by this kid who they could not incarcerate for long periods of time. Eventually, someone had the idea to kidnap Boy Jones and ship him to Brazil. True story. He did return at some point, but then he was deported to Australia. By 1840, another young man at the palace had a keen interest in Victoria's undergarments, but this was a legitimate interest, as the young man was her husband, Prince Albert. Highly intelligent and hyperactive, the prince consort soon 
soon pointed out a few of the palace's shortcomings. The residence was absolutely lacking in nurseries, and there weren't enough rooms for visitors. How could he possibly set up a functioning B&B &B if there weren't enough rooms for visitors? Finally, in 1845, Victoria gained permission and some funds from Prime Minister Robert Peel to extend Buckingham Palace. Additional budget was raised thanks to the sale of another architectural extravagance, courtesy of George IV and John Nash, the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, which is a royal seaside getaway. Bloor was again in charge. His plan was to add a fourth wing, which would complete the quadrangular shape of the palace. The new fourth wing became the main facade, adorned by an element suggested by Prince Albert, the central balcony, now a staple of royal celebrations. From the balcony, Queen Victoria watched her troops leave for the Crimean War in the autumn of 1853 and welcomed them on their return in the spring of 1856. When the Redcoats were charging at Balaclava, Victoria and Albert proceeded to do more work at the palace. In 1855, their new architect, James Pennethorne, completed the ballroom, the concert room, and the ball supper room. On the exterior, John Nash's triumphal arch was dismantled and rebuilt at the northeast corner of Hyde Park. It is now known as Marble Arch, a tourist attraction in its own right. The days in which the standard had panned the palace were long gone. Now, trade publication, the builder designated the royal residence as the headquarters of taste. Unfortunately, the Industrial Revolution couldn't tell the difference between a fine piece of architecture and any old swamp shack. Over the following decades, the notorious London smog and soot began to blacken and damage the palace's facade. Victoria's son, King Edward VII, was not yet too concerned about the exterior, preferring to invest in interior design. It was he who personally chose the white and gold decorative color scheme, which can now be admired in the magnificent white drawing room. Edward had been assisted in this and many other endeavors by our next unwanted visitor, Major John Gwynne, the King's personal secretary. And let me clarify, as a secretary, Gwynne was surely allowed to enter the palace, but the unfortunate major found himself at the center of a scandal when his marriage failed. The divorce proceedings were the fuel of palace gossip, and John's decision had been met with the disapproval of his contemporaries. One evening, after dinner, Major Gwynne withdrew to his office on the first floor. He sat down at his desk, pulled a revolver from a drawer, and shot himself, unable to bear any longer the loneliness and shame brought by his situation. It was after his suicide that Major John Gwynne became an uninvited guest. Almost immediately after he shot himself, personnel at Buckingham Palace began reporting sightings of a shadowy figure standing just outside the secretary's office. The apparition was often accompanied by an overwhelming feeling of dread and depression. Sometimes, late at night, a single loud gunshot could still be heard from within the Major's room, allegedly. For a building with such a long and rich history, Buckingham Palace has apparently only two ghosts, which is too too many. They are made Major Gwynne's and that of a monk sometimes spotted dragging a chain through the vast corridors dressed in a brown robe and hood. The monk is said to have lived in a monastery which stood on these grounds long before King James's Mulberry Garden. The monastery had then been shut down and possibly even pillaged or burnt by Henry VIII after his schism from the Pope. By the early 20th century, the ambience of the palace was surely fertile grounds for morbid imaginations. The outside walls had by now taken a dingy, darkened appearance as smog and soot had been building up for decades. This is why, in 1913, King George V decided to give the whole facade a complete makeover. The chosen architect was Sir Aston Webb, an efficient and energetic designer known for his work on the Victoria and Albert Museum and the University of Birmingham. Webb chose Portland Stone, which had to be quarried, cut, and transported to London from the Isle of Portland off the coast of Dorset. This whole operation took 12 months, but when the building work began, Sir Webb did not faff about. Within 13 weeks, he had given the old chap Buckingham a complete facelift. This is the front we all know today, the backdrop to millions of tourist selfies and, let's not forget, many historical events of the 20th and 21st century. One event that risked obliterating the palace, or at least severely damaging it, was the Blitz, the German bombing campaign of London during World War II. The royal building was hit nine times by Luftwaffe bombs, and for some of those, King George VI and his wife Queen Elizabeth were in residence. The worst hit was the one that destroyed the palace chapel in 1940, an event which prompted the Queen to say, I'm glad we've been bombed. It makes me feel like I can look the East End in the face. The East Ends had been the hardest hit area in all of London. The royal family famously did not leave Buckingham Palace during the duration of the war, a morale booster for Londoners during their ordeal. On VE Day, May the 8th, 1945, both Winston Churchill and the royal family greeted the crowds from Bloor's balcony. 
In February of 1952, a new royal was installed in Buckingham Palace. Our current queen, Elizabeth II, honoured the royal tradition of marrying an overactive prince of German origin. Of course, we're talking about the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip of Mountbatten. In 1962, the Prince Consort took the initiative of refurbishing the former royal chapel, which sat empty since it had been hit in the Blitz. Under his direction, it became the Queen's Gallery, home to the vast art collection of the royal family. The gallery displays about 450 pieces at a time, but the overall collection is much vaster. It features 268,972 items, from A, accessories for food service, to Z, zithers, from Neolithic flints and antlers to the Union Jack badge worn by astronaut Timothy Peak on a suit. The most famous part of the collection are its 5,584 paintings, many of them by all-time masters like Rembrandt. When you mention the Queen and her art collection, fans of a certain Netflix series may guess the identity of our next unwanted guest at Buckingham Palace. This man was Anthony Blunt, a distant relative of Her Majesty, who had worked at the palace as surveyor of the King's pictures and eventually the Queen's pictures since the end of World War II. Blunt had been an MI5 agent during the war. After quitting the services, he began curating the Windsor's collection of fine art, a job he excelled at. But in 1965, his former employers at MI5 received a tip from the US Department of Justice. Since the early 1930s, Anthony Blunt had been a double agent at the service of the Soviet Union and a leading member of the infamous spy ring known as the Cambridge Five. For more than 30 years, Blunt had evaded all scrutiny and suspicion and landed an appointment within the heart of the British establishment. Was he still working for the Soviets while at the palace? Well, according to author John Costello, probably yes. His Soviet handlers would likely have never allowed Blunt to leave MI5 unless he was to continue reporting to them. MI5 informed the government and the Queen, of course, but Blunt was not prosecuted. He wasn't even dismissed from his job. Privately, British counterintelligence were concerned that exposing Blunt to the public would have caused an enormous scandal, much to the detriment of the Queen and the government. Thus, the art curator was offered an immunity deal, freedom from prosecution in exchange for a full confession, as well as a list of 12 more Soviet spies. Historians Hugh Trevor Roper and John Costello bring an additional royal element to the mix. In 1945, Anthony Blunt had retrieved some undisclosed royal documents that had been in possession of German relatives of the Windsors. These papers may have included letters sent Adolf Hitler by none other than the Duke of Windsor, formerly Edward VIII, who had abdicated to marry Wallace Simpson. In his letters, the Duke informs the Fuhrer of Britain's early war plans. This would have been a crucial piece of intel that may have contributed to German victory during the Battle of France. Blunt may have used this secret as leverage to avoid prosecution. Blunt continued to work as surveyor of the Queen's pictures until 1972, when he was appointed advisor of the Queen's pictures pictures and drawings. He held this post until his retirement in 1978. As befits her role, the Queen did not elaborate on her feelings regarding a potentially active communist spy within her household. But maybe she didn't consider him to be an intruder. I mean, he was kind of family after all. A few years later, she would be confronted by a much more clean-cut case of home invasion when, in 1982, the same man managed to break into the palace twice. This was 32-year-old Michael Fagan. According to different versions, the motives behind his actions were either a bet with friends down the pub or an overdose of magic mushrooms. So here is apparently what happens. On the first occasion, Fagan simply climbed a wall at night to get into the inner perimeter before dragging himself up a drainpipe and entering the bedroom window of a shocked maid. The poor lady ran straight to security, but when they arrived, Fagan had already left the room and was free to roam undisturbed. Fagan then proceeded to drink some wine that he found in Prince Charles's empty room, which he recalled as being cheap Californian. After much wandering, Fagan could not find a toilet. Desperate needs call for desperate measures, and he eventually urinated in a large container of corgi food. Fagan was able to leave undisturbed that night. So, less than a month later, he decided to have another go. On the second night, he walked through King George V's multi-million pound stamp collection, triggering the alarm twice, but security simply turned it off, believing it to be a false alarm. Eventually, Fagan entered the Sancta Sanctorum of the palace, the Queen's bedroom, where she was sleeping alone. According to the most popular account, Her Majesty kept her composure and spoke calmly to the intruder until finally police arrived to arrest him. But according to Fagan, the Queen simply asked, What are you doing? here. Fagan then dashed out of the room. An unarmed footman then came to stand watch until the police came. Fagan recalled the footman saying, Craw fucking hell, mate. You look like you need a drink. And a drink he had, a glass of famous grouse whiskey poured by the footman himself. 
Three generations of Brits are still laughing at the incident, but the resulting scandal was no joke. Then Home Secretary Willie Whitelaw admitted to huge failings in security and offered his resignation, which was rejected by a very understanding Queen. Palace security was ramped up following the incident, and yet many years later, another intruder proved that it may not have been up to raw scratch. In August of 2003, Daily Mirror undercover reporter Ryan Parry applied for a position of footman at Buckingham Palace. And I use the term undercover very loosely here. Parry had applied with his real name, and he was already a known journalist at the time. He omitted his reporter experience from the CV and provided the phone number for a pub manager as a reference. The interviewer at the palace phoned the pub. When he could not speak to the manager, he apparently just spoke to some other random dude, and that was that. References and background checks done. Parry was hired and started working at Buckingham Palace in September. His following expose in the mirror revealed many details of a day in the life of a royal servant. On a typical day, a footman must be ready for action at 7.30 a.m., armed with a tray of tea, oat cakes, and honey for Prince Philip, while other personnel set up Her Majesty's breakfast table according to a carefully designated plan. A photo of said table caused a nationwide sensation as it showed the Queen's cereal laid out inside a humble Tupperware container. Footmen, valets, maids, cooks, and underbutlers must abide by grueling routines working up to 14 hours a day. It's a stretch of time during which they must always be at the ready, albeit unseen and unheard. Parry describes how he was instructed to walk along the edges of rugs and carpets lest his footprints be noticed, or how he had to stand in the corner for hours on end waiting for a member of the royal family to finish their coffee before he could pick up the tray, walk a few paces, and hand it over to another valet. The personnel are provided accommodation within Buckingham Palace, but this is basic to say the least, with little furniture or comfort. The pay does not seem appropriate for the effort demanded £9,000 per year in 2003, or about £14,000 in today's money. During his time in the service, Parry was even able to access the quarters used by George and Laura Bush during their official visit. This highlighted another blatant security blunder. Literally, some random guy with a doctored CV and fake references could have entered at any time the bedroom of the President of the United States and, I don't know, throw a shoe at him or something. I will not go further into recent events concerning the royal family as we've covered the lives of some of them in biographics before. And I really hope you enjoyed this historical exploration of Buckingham Palace. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Do support our sponsor Raycon, link to them below, and thank you for watching.